So hello and welcome to the increasingly misnamed January 2022 edition of No Diagnostic Required, a monthly look at what's happening in the C++ community. With me, Phil Nash, and my co-host here, Anastasia Kozakova. What's going on on your end this month, Anastasia? Um, nothing really, so pretty much busy with lots of work going on, like EP releases, but I think we'll cover that later. <laughs> yes, yeah, we do have a, a section for that, so we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll defer that for now. Um, How about you? Well, I, I was thinking, um, I, I know you've talked a few times before on this show about the um, the podcast you listen to, uh, often while swimming, which which is quite interesting. Uh, I've been getting a bit behind on my podcast listening, but uh, this year I've actually been getting back to the gym a bit more regularly and found that I've actually caught up on most of my podcasts. So oh, there you go. Cool. If, you, uh, if you want to, to be healthy in your podcast habit, then, then hit the gym. That's, uh, that's my advice. Yeah, and no, I actually, no to do it. I actually saw you also captured a few more episodes of CPP Chat, so you're actually fulfilling the promise. <laughs> yep, it's not just listening to podcasts, but but making them as well. So yeah, we've uh, <laughs> we've done a couple of episodes just recently. There's there's one, it's just about to go live, uh, probably just before this one. So um, yeah, listen to CPP Chat as well, of course. <laughs> now we did actually promise last month that there were going to be some changes this month and we didn't just mean that it's going to be even later than usual <laughs> that there's, there's a few factors in that um you know mostly uh, illness and, and a few other things but um due to some entirely unrelated unfortunate events those planned changes uh, we've had to push back a little bit longer so we're gonna to have to tease you on that for one month more so all going well next month there'll be some big changes watch for those that's all i can say for now <laughs> For this month, though, back to our usual format. So I'm going to get started by putting up uh, this this article. Yeah, I like it. Actually, that's a very interesting article. That's a very practical use case, I would say, written by Cameron de Camara from Microsoft. So, And it's talking about eliminating runtime bugs. And these bugs are actually called by, uh, caused by format specifiers. This is happening. Uh, this was happening in the Microsoft compiler code when printing compiler error messages. And I, I assume everyone realized that actually compiler prints a tons of them. You know, especially if you're doing something wrong. So, uh, and this is a very important part. And so they're often hands with like extra information passed via format specifiers naturally because the compiler tries to actually explains you what's going wrong. So try and kind of help you. Um, so, and the problem was that they are like the format specifiers, they are not type checked in the call. And so users might get actually, the final users might get into trouble with the runtime errors if the compiler developers kind of mistakenly pass a wrong argument or don't pass one at all. So that might be an issue. So uh, the Microsoft team, they decided to kind of work around that issues, trying to find some solution with the modern C++ features. So they were, first of all, trying C++ 14 and 17. And the solution was that were, they were trying to apply is to check the format specifiers at compile time. So, but the const expert approach actually didn't work because it was kind of impossible to make all error call const expert and also pass like some template parameters because they actually need to update the whole code base, which was unacceptable. So that wasn't um, an option. So they later turned to C20 and they found like uh, const eval as a nice solution. And they use something very similar to what uh, formatting library FMT is doing. Uh, with some like user defined type and to evaluate strings at compile time. So uh, th there is a code uh, code piece in the article, so you can see how they actually were doing that. And the interesting um, outcome is that they actually managed to identify something more than 100 problematic calls. So without touching actually any of the calls, so they just introduced this um, kind of user defined type and they didn't update any calls, but they found actually some reasonable issues. And that sounds to me like a great number, you know, so when you can just, you know, find some issues with just introducing some a little bit new approach with some new language features that actually shows me that the new features are really useful, you know, so you can just not write new code in a nice way. You can also eliminate bugs in an old code without actually touching this old code. So just introducing like a small addition to it. 
And that sounds great to me. So that's what impressed me. I don't know. What about you, Phil? So I'm, I'm going to pretend that I haven't read this article. And, and you may <laughs> find this quite convincing. But I, I'm, I'm assuming, first of all, that, that this is separate from the, um, the, the compile time checking of format specifiers coming in, in stood format. Uh, that, is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is something they've they've done internally to. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that was just completely sort of an internal work. So they were mm. just using this for Magon Library as an example of showing what they do because they definitely were not showing the actual compiler code in the article. So just to explain what was the approach. So that's a very nice just explanation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's still a very uh, sort of leading edge uh, C plus plus that they're doing <laughs> there, which, which is which is nice. But obviously, so many things are moving to. The uh, compile time, uh, whether it's uh, const expr or const eval, even better in uh, since C plus plus twenty. What one thing that strikes me is that we often think of this move, moving stuff to compile time as being more of a performance thing. Obviously, if it's pre-computed, it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. computed at runtime, so yeah, it'll be a true. performance boost. And sometimes that's that's what you wanted. Sometimes that's not that useful in your particular context. But being able to find bugs before you even run something. That's uh, always going to be useful, I think. And for me, that's usually the, the biggest part of moving stuff to, to compile time, is just, just finding the bugs before the code even compiles. So I think that's yeah, th- uh, th- definitely th- that's absolutely here. true. That's what I call magic, you know, when you just, you know, <laughs> take the new standard, introduce some piece of code, and then surprisingly, something is starting to happen. And like, yeah, with this um, compile time things, that's always the magic, which I see in that way. So yeah, so just... Nice, nice, actually, case so that they described. So uh, I, I mentioned std format, and the and you also mentioned the FMT library that it's based on. I think we've got some news on that as well. You want to take us through this one? Yeah, I think uh, we can, we can discuss that. It's not not like directly related, but since we started talking about the FMT, which was taken by uh, Dekamara, is just an example. Uh, so that's a nice blog post written by Viktor Zorovich in his blog, and it's about like uh, migrating to a safer API with a uh, eighth version of FMT. And it just shared a few interesting cases when the migration uh, to the newer version actually eliminated several classes of bugs and made the code safer. So not just several specific issues, but several classes of bugs, which looks nice to me. So, and probably the main driver uh, for the change and for the like improvement uh, was the compile time format string checks. So enabled by default now. And that really helped in many cases uh, when the format specifier is not implemented or something is just going wrong. So there is now detected at compile time. And it's much, this is actually much better, definitely, than throwing a formatting error like during the runtime. So, and that actually eliminated a whole class of issues. And he highlights uh, like a couple of um, useful cases where that helped. Then there was the strict pointer diagnostics, which helped. The um, example in the article, it looked to me a little bit artificial because there was an issue with passing a function pointer. Um, uh, which was not capped before, and then like yeah, that um, that was capped with a newer version. I, I can't say that I'm really a big fan of this example, but it at least shows yeah that the strict pointer diagnostic helped there. And the third one, which is I do consider also quite useful, is the no discard used to annotate formatting functions, and it actually helped with the family of cases when the format string was kind of like created but not used. And I think that's often happens when you like you created a few strings, maybe decided to put it to the logs or somewhere, and then completely forgot about it, and now you just can't escape. So because of the no discard, so yeah, there are a few cases uh, like that in the article, so you can like read through them and uh, yeah, see how they were improved. And I think that's the whole article. So that that that's it. And yeah, a nice cat. <laughs> I have to mention that. <laughs> Any well, comments here? Use, you have to use cat too to write the output. I think that's the uh, <laughs> point. <laughs> yep. um, yeah, again, just a, a more of a general point. I mean, we, we already talked about the, the move to compile time and eliminating bugs that way, but um, also just the fact that both uh, stood format, that this is, that was uh, based on the FMT library, and 
FMT itself are continuing to get lots of updates moving forwards. I, I think that's a that's a really good thing because we've we've been stuck for so long with such basic input and output facilities in C++ that it's, it's nice to see all the attention on it. So I, I don't have anything else specifically to say on this this article. Just just that in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. There was uh, another article that uh, that you proposed. This one, compile time, again, code, code <laughs> generation and optimization. Yeah. Uh, this I, one I, from uh, Unifin. Yeah, I'm kind of keen about the <laughs> compile time this time. <laughs> and uh, I have to say that uh, Unifin blog is one of my favorites, actually. And uh, his blog posts are usually quite detailed and they share some interesting stories. So, and I like this one definitely. So it's, yeah, about a compile time, you can guess from the title. So, and it's about the situations when you want to specify something in some kind of a DSL language and uh, at compile time, and you want to have it executed at compile time as well. So you probably have uh, some cases like that, or at least you're interested in kind of how to do that. So there is an interesting example he's using. So he's using this like brain fuck parsing example. And so the program is given as a string literal and the execution happens at compile time. So, and the goal is actually to show the power of context where you can like, yeah, guess from the title. So there is like step-by-step solution uh, Jonathan is building in the article. So he starts with the uh, virtual machine operating on just an array of instructions. And so the program is kind of known at compile time. So array is fixed. So that's fine. It's still not executing at the compile time. So then he's trying to, you know, go to that point. So um uh, the execute function he's using there, he's converting it to a tail recursion, and then he's just uh, making an observation that arguments of the recursive call can be computed at compile time. And that means that the recursive uh, execute function are actually turned into the template instantiation, and that's the magic. So um, then everything is just, you know, happening um, like in compile time, and that that's the real magic of the compile time you see when you have all these things parsed and executed nicely. So the example might sound a little bit artificial again, like maybe it's not uh, very practical, but from the other side, like usually the death cells are quite simple if you use them in that way. So they um, like maybe not the brain facts, but like, you know, very, very, very basic things with just a few comments and uh yeah you you can have something like that like a program given you just like a string literal and you want to execute it somehow so anyway um i think that's a good example of how you can use the const expert uh, from the practical point of view and another just good example of how you can do the magic i mean like the when Jonathan is going from recursive uh, tail recursion to this uh, like template instantiation that was a real like moment of you know some insight for me <laughs> how that happened so that's how we should probably turn our minds right now in c++ with all these context for things uh i'm still not doing that automatically in my head i think <laughs> so i think uh, i still a little bit outdated in that st- sense and every time i see this kind of magic it kind of inspires me to try more uh but yeah i think we need to do these exercises to just to get used to it so yeah uh what do you think so um as will have become apparent by now but for some of the same reasons that we're very late this month i haven't read any of the articles that, uh, that you put forward <laughs> so <laughs> I, I can only give a, a general response again but uh, i do still believe that this area of generative programming is the sort of the next frontier in uh, programming paradigms and we're just on the cusp of it at the moment and it's it's great that c++ is sort of poised there ready with at least half the story so the concept for stuff gives you the uh, the ability to do the compile time parsing and uh, it's great that um Unifin and others are doing stuff on the generative side um despite limitations there but really it's going to be when we get the compile time reflection that will have the, mm-hmm. the hopefully the full set of tools to to move forward and other languages read a bit ahead of us there. Uh, D has had uh, these sort of facilities for, for some time now. But um, yeah, th- this article in particular is one that I'm going to go away and, and read carefully because I'm really keen to see how far he's able to, to push it with the current limitations. So Yeah, there are actually uh, ni- nice links so you can play with the examples in yeah. like Compiler Explorer. So 
like yeah you can go forward and push it more maybe <laughs> yeah absolutely okay um talking of pushing the frontiers of c++ we have our regular standards news section um slightly special month this month in two two levels really so every uh, few months three or four months we have the the plenary session in the um uh, in the committee so it's usually when everyone goes away for, for a week somewhere and the end of the week is just the, the the plenary meeting where everybody makes the official votes now when everything's moved online uh, that's just a obviously an online zoom call uh, but it still happens on the same sort of schedule uh, so this is where papers are actually adopted into the working draft for the next standard and this particular plenary session i think we mentioned this last month is has been decided as being that the cutoff really for any new design or any new papers to to be adopted in so there'll still be work going on mostly on the wording side between now and when c plus plus 23 is finalized but in terms of getting anything new in this is really it so it's quite a uh, quite a big month for c plus plus 23 really so what i've decided to do is just pick some of the the papers that made it into this plenary and there's actually a uh, page on github that's a repository that tracks the status of all the the papers and you can do a uh, a filter on there uh, I'll, I'll put the uh, the link in the show notes to show what got accepted at plenary this month so um that's what i've been basing this off now on the the library side because of course you have the language side and the library side this month of i think it was um 16 papers on the library side i think five of them were to do with ranges so quite a big chunk uh, if you pardon the pun if you because <laughs> there's a couple of papers to do with chunking uh, but a big chunk of them were to do with with ranges which really sort of demonstrates how important uh, ranges are to the um you know the priorities of c plus plus 23 they've been given quite a lot of uh, emphasis and in fact there is a this overarching paper um which I've, uh, I've lost the uh, the paper number for, uh, P2214. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, a plan for C++ ranges. So this was early on what we were aiming to get into C++23 for ranges. Quite a lot there, very ambitious. And we certainly haven't got all of it, but a good chunk of that, again, same pun, um, has actually made it in. Uh, five of them in this month alone. So uh, I wanted to start off by by picking a couple of those. So. The first one I want to look at, P2441, the view join with, which uh, which seems simple enough, but if you've used other higher level languages, I mean, Python's a great example here. You're probably very familiar with just a, a simple function to take a collection of items and just join them together into, into one item. Um, it's often done with strings. So you've got a you know, collection of strings, you just want a single string, and they will usually be able to provide some sort of delimiter character as well, like a comma, for example. So quick and easy way to just produce a comma-separated list of values from a, from a collection. Now, we say plus plus 20, we got a view join, which did the first part of that, just the collecting um, a collection together into a single item, but without the delimiter. So for that sort of string processing in particular, it wasn't as useful as it could be. So that's what view join with fixes just gives you that ability to provide a, a delimiter something that goes in between all the things that are being joined together and obviously more general than strings but that's the, the obvious application for it so nice to see that that go in and um, just this uh, trend towards I mean, we often think of all these new c++ language features as just making the language more complex but very often all the complexity is going on under the hood so that we actually get some nice simple high level features like this yeah we can get over our python envy at least on, <laughs> on this score <laughs> um talking of range adapters because join with is a range adapter there's a um uh, another paper about range adapters this is um p2387 pipe support for easy to find range adapters so if you've used ranges you'll know that composing ranges together is or composing range adapters together 
things you can do on, on ranges. You usually do with the pipe operator, just the, you know, the vertical line. And if you think about it, what it's actually doing is it's effectively transforming a, a function that is called with an argument to argument pipe function. It's as if you're piping the argument into the function. It's just like a nice visual metaphor. And when you're composing many functions together like that, or many range adapters together, uh, it's really useful to do it that way. So many functional languages uh, have a, a dedicated operator that just works on any function that takes a single argument. And well, you just pipe them together so you can push a piece of data in at the front and you just pipe it through many, many layers of functions. If you write that out in normal functional syntax with um, you know, brackets, it can get like very heavily nested brackets. So that's why we do that in, in ranges to make it uh, nice and easy to, to read and, and follow. Uh, trouble is that only really works with the built-in range adapters. So if you provided your own, then you, you couldn't use it, not without a lot of, lot of work anyway. So this paper addresses that and gives you the, the ability to, just with a simple bit of um, uh, extension code to, to hook onto a customization point, give your own range adapters or some third party range adapters the ability to use the pipe syntax with ranges. So again, makes everything much uh, nicer and easier to read at the high level because all the, all the hard work's gone on under the hood. Yeah, so, I actually definitely agree that uh, the ranges, they require some more work and polishing. Um, mm -hmm. I just recently was kind of surprised. I was reading through Jonathan Beccaro's post about the equal range when I realized that the C++20 is the first standard when you can actually, you know, uh, deal with ranges and return some range and not some, you know, similar abstraction, which is not just the range, but just the pointer to the beginning and the end. And that surprised me. I realized that we have like whole things uh, not really ready with ranges. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's why this um, this paper was written, the um, plan for C++23 ranges, because it was seen like, well, you know, the, the groundwork's all there, but there was a lot missing still, mostly from uh, Ranges V3, Eric Niebler's library. There was a mm -hmm. lot there that didn't get standardized early on, but we knew we wanted just a case of getting it through the process. So that, that's why that's been prioritized. It's good to see a lot of that's got in, but there's still, still quite a few things that haven't made it yet. Um, any other comments on Yeah, I just... Uh, have I got you right that actually the join and join with, they are like kind of both in. I mean, like, do we really need two separate versions? I mean, what's the deal for using join now if you have a join with? Um, as far as I know, I haven't looked at this in detail, but as far as I know, the only difference is that uh, delimiter. So, yeah, you could argue that if you have an so empty you, uh, delimiter, okay. so you, you can't then escape it. Will be the it. Same, but, mm -hmm. Yeah. But we. Okay. We didn't have it in join, so we've had to have join with. But if you don't need it, I mean, if you're um, joining things that aren't strings, it's probably not as useful as with strings. I imagine that's the, the main use case. But um, again, mm -hmm. I haven't looked at all the, all the okay. use cases that have been investigated. Okay, yeah, that just was interested. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's say there are, there are a few other range-related ones. In fact, I was talking to um, to Connor Hoekstra about this just before because I wanted to make sure I got some of my facts right. He's been quite involved in, in this process. And he said he was particularly pleased that the um, uh, the chunking range adapters got in. Uh, so I forget the names now, so I didn't prepare these uh, these are slides, but uh, I think it's a chunk by, um, and there's a couple of variations on it, which uh, let you... Um, take a sort of a single linear uh, collection, let's say a vector, but any range, any linear range, and produce a, a range of ranges where each sub-range is, you know, the elements relate to each other somehow. So you provide some, usually an operator that will relate those items together. And when that operation no longer turns true or whatever the, the condition is, then it chunks into a new range. So that, that's actually a really uh, useful algorithm that's actually really can be quite hard to to write yourself so it's, uh, it's good that that's now 
one of the um, uh, the built-in vocabulary types in the ranges library. So definitely maturing. Uh, definitely still some maturing to go yet. So moving off of ranges, in fact, the the biggest new library feature that made it into C plus plus twenty three this month, which is something we've expected for a while. I think we even mentioned this last month in passing, um, but stood expected. Uh, it made it to revision eleven before finally wow. getting adopted <laughs> in the uh, in the latest plenary. So, yeah, finally that's in the language, or, or will be. I mean, it's in the working draft. I should clarify. <laughs> will be adopted into the language, assuming it's not taken out, but um, there's, there's no reason to expect that would happen. So yeah, um, I'm not going to say a lot more about it because we have discussed it a couple of times before. So we mentioned it last month, gave it a little bit of coverage, and I think last April we, we covered it in a bit more, more depth. But yeah, similar to optional, but also allows you to provide another type in the case that the value you wanted isn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, the simple explanation but yeah this was the only library that was considered uh, large so if you, again if you go back to that github repository one of the tags is like small medium large i think um and this was the only one tagged large that actually got adopted in on the, the, the library side so that was interesting <laughs> any, any any other thoughts on that one yeah, not really i think yeah it, it was yeah, kind of expected <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Even though revision eleven did, yeah, yeah, but uh, very much eleventh hour. <laughs> um, the final one I wanted to to highlight is um, a smaller one, but a really useful one. So we, we've had this um, as a compiler extension on for many compilers for some time, but uh, really valuable to have this standardized, and that's just simply a function that marks code as unreachable, which. On the face of it, it seems not that useful, but it's uh, it's one of those things where compilers can't always prove that a certain line of code will not be reached, and it would either complain that you haven't got a return value there, or various other diagnostics kick in, or, or it can't optimize something away, and it has to write extra code because this, this could happen. So if you know better, and that, that's the caveat, you have to actually know better. Um, then you can put this this line in, um, stood unreachable, and that's just telling the compiler to assume that this line of code will never be reached, and to optimize by it once, and to not warn about things that it might otherwise warn about. So um, let's say that there are built-ins for doing this now. Uh, a, a common use case, and I think this is one that's actually quoted in the paper, and it's one that I've used in a talk recently, as it happens. Is when you've got a, um, a a switch statement over an enum, and you know that you have exhaustively used all of the enum values, or at least all of the enum values that could possibly be, uh, find their way into this block of code, then it's never going to drop off the end of that switch statement if you've say you're returning out of it. That means that just beyond the switch statement, that line would never be reached, and you know it may, may be expecting a return statement there. Or, or there may be some other reason that compilers can complain if you don't do anything else. They're just putting uh, stood unreachable there. Will will silence the compiler at that point. But the other interesting aspect to stood unreachable is that you can actually implement assumptions in terms of it. So we talked about the uh, the portable assumptions paper a few months ago. Now uh, that was also being dusted off, pushing for C plus plus twenty three. Looks like it hasn't made it. I, I haven't been involved in the discussion to know whether the fact that Stud and Reachable has made it in as a factor in that or not. I suspect not, but I think it was discussed at the time that yeah, you could actually implement assumptions in terms of Stud and Reachable. Um, it's not quite as nice. You have to do it with a macro, and it's uh, it's a bit of a workaround. But yeah, if we don't have uh, assume, then we can use Stud and Reachable now. In, in some places to still have a, a portable version of assumptions, at least to, to some extent. And uh, I think we'll have to get um, uh, Timo on to, to talk more about that at some point <laughs> <laughs> as the author of the uh, the assumptions paper. Yeah, yeah, probably. I'm just like wondering about this um, student reachable, like 
one thing which is a little bit um, kind of unexpected maybe to me is that uh, they turned it from, unexpected. yeah, kind of being an attribute <laughs> to being a function. And that's mm -hmm. a little bit maybe weird, or I do not understand the reasoning behind that quite well. Probably it's discussed in this, what what is revision free, so probably I need to check it out. Yeah. So because that's interesting, I would expect an attribute, I would say, not a function. So, but maybe it makes sense. Yeah, if I remember rightly, I think it was because they did consider uh, an attribute. Um, I can't remember the reasoning, but I would would have thought that an attribute usually um, annotates something else, like a function called or a type or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is the line of code. It's saying at this point, this this is the condition that holds. So okay. I don't know if that's the actual reason or not, whether there was another reason. We'll have to go back and have a look. So there's some homework. Yeah, pro pro probably you're right with that. So because just to me, it looked a little bit like, you know, we have unused and then, yeah, unreachable. They're kind of close. But maybe you're right about reasoning with line of code. So, yeah, maybe that's the reason. Like, anyway, I think th th they have some discussions um, in the past revisions. So we can check. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do. I wouldn't make any assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just because kind of unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's um, all I wanted to get through this month. Now, usually I make the caveat, or at least I should, that all the things we talk about in the standards news section, these are things that have been considered for future versions of the language. They're not actually in it now. This time, all of the papers we've talked about, they have been officially voted in to the working draft for C++23. So they, they should be in C++23, barring some, um, something that, that never happens, that we take stuff out. But <laughs> I don't expect it for any of these. Uh, and there were, uh, I think, about 18 things that were adopted in this time. So there's a few more to go and have a look at. So have a look at that GitHub repo that I put a link in. So that takes us on to the to the tools section. And we've got a couple of things to to get through this time. So I'll hand back over to to you, Anastasia for uh, to have a look at Qt. Yeah, like um, I will try to kind of share the story here. There were actually several blog posts uh, on a Qt blog site. Um, like they were all very, very interested. I would just try to summarize the main idea, but like, if you're interested, you can just check there. Are, I think more than three of them, uh, quite detailed. So the idea is that, um, in January, the cute block introduced like this series of article, uh, on a new thing they are working on right now. And they actually tr introduced it to the, um, to the customers. That's the cute quick compiler for QML. So, and the goal was to increase the compilation speed. So like that the QML could run at a speed close to a native as they announced it in the blog. So, and it's important to remind that QML is an interpreter language. So there is a performance cost. And so they were trying actually to reduce this cost. And that was a very um, interesting goal on its own. So, and a very interesting path behind the final solution. So they had, uh, this one. So there is a blog post about the reasoning and there is like a blog post with some benchmarks, but uh, this one specifically is about the technology and how it evolved for different versions of Qt. So how they were actually uh, moving to the final solution. So they first started from compiling into C++. So the, the path actually to the new compiler just started from compiling QML scripts into C++ and using QML engine's private API. So that kind of worked, but um, the problem was, and like the, the next step, they uh, targeted at specifically optimizing the runtime aspect. So, uh, and for this, they they were using some kind of a caching approach, and they were caching some uh, bytecode representation for functions and expressions. Um, and interestingly. That really helped. So that worked better than just C++ code uh, generated by the like old Qt uh, Qt compiler. And the reason was that the C++ code was quite generic. So it actually doesn't know anything about like some Qt specifics and some Qt meta type system. So um, it just has uh, these kind of generic guesses while like yeah caching uh, some more specific uh, for 
uh, like this bite code, which is more specific for acute, uh, make sense in terms of their performance and just reduce the type checking overhead. So looking at that, they decided kind of to combine <laughs> those two, I would say, and trying to get uh, like the best solution out of both worlds. So uh, following this logic, they were just trying to resolve this problem of generic code, uh, which they uh, kind of realized. And so they just uh, started a way of declaring the QML types together with the C++ types back in them. And so th there was just added a, they added a possibility to provide some type information in function signatures, and they deal some uh, had some changes uh, around the whole uh, build system. They are like relying on CMake APIs. That's all just some specific details. But the final result is that uh, they now have this new, as they call it, new Qt quick compiler, which actually consists of two parts. So there is QML script compiler to compile functions and expressions in QML files. Um, of an application into C++ code and QML type compiler to compile QML object structures into C++ classes. And so interestingly, what I found really interesting is that they not just uh, added this kind of a new scheme and this new like two, two parts uh, of this new compiler, but they also added um, a tool as far as I understood to help users um, to kind of enhance their code so that it actually uh, compiled faster and it's like uh, the code they are producing is better. So if you have kind of bad code, which is uh, not compiled quickly and there is like the new compiler is not doing a good job on your QML QML code, then th their tools could actually help you write better QML code, which will compile faster. And I think that that's kind of impressive that they have a tools which help you to um, kind of use the good practices, you know, uh, to apply them to your code and get a better result. So they have, um, I guess, a whole blog post, separate blog post uh, about the performance benefits of the new approach. So with lots of charts, so you can see how it uh, works on um, some real examples. But yeah, so generally, even if you're not in the Qt world and are not developing uh, in Qt, the whole approach was quite interesting. So how they just started for some very basic ideas of compiling into C++, then they realized that, yeah, they can do some caching and it works because like this just uh, enhanced with the information about the Qt meta types, and then they just combined it and added some tools to help you uh, add this information to your code and produce a better code faster. So yeah, the whole um, idea is kind of interesting and the whole approach. And indeed, there are like just uh, several posts on this way. They are all linked. So if you just start with the, uh, with one, <laughs> you'll find the others. Um, so yeah, just um, an interesting example of how the technology could evolve and how it could help you to uh, to move to a new version. So yeah, that that's mostly it. Any ideas here? Well, one thing that struck me is that uh, all the, the Qt tools, they, they always try to work in some way to, to start them with the letter Q. But in this case, it already does. So um, I think that's probably why they chose the, the name Quick Compiler, <laughs> because it already starts with the letter Q. Although presumably there's mm -hmm. a quicker compiler that, that does the, uh, the, the checking to make sure that you're writing <laughs> things that work quickly enough. But I haven't yeah. looked into that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, moving on then, I know there's some some JetBrains news on the EAP front. Can you talk, talk us through that. Yeah, I mentioned that in the, in the very beginning that I was quite busy with uh, all the things um, happening here. So. You know, uh, January was the time when we were starting all our EAP programs and preparing for the new releases, first releases uh, in 2022, which are going to happen uh, somewhere around March. So uh, I will talk about like some C++ tools we have in the pockets. So like, first of all, uh, uh, I think I mentioned that before that in like our tools, this first release, we decided to focus on quality improvements and bug fixing. So that mostly will be it. So with uh, not that many like new features uh, coming in. So just only those which were still polishing from some previous release cycles and just want to deliver them finally. Um, so if we talk about the C line, so the team is polishing the new remote development workflow. So we introduced support for space-deaf environments, which means there is some kind of a warm-up now available. 
uh, which really helps in terms of that you can not just, you know, develop remotely with the thin client, but also kind of reuse these deaf environments, share this knowledge and share these um, environments inside the team. And that really looks like a productivity booster. Um, then we actually polished the tool chains and CMIC profile settings uh, to make them just more flexible to fix some uh, issues uh, which our users uh, pointed us to. Uh, we added the preview for intention actions, this kind of uh, small helper. So if you're trying, you know, to update the code and you're not just, you know, reading the description of what the ID suggests you to do, but also just see the resulting code so that you can like guess quicker if you actually need that. Um, we also reworked the UI for Clunk tidy settings. So if you work with the Clunk tidy settings in the ID, there's, there's now like a nice UI with a tree, which you can use the speed search to search for, like turn the settings on and off. And most usefully Finally. probably, yeah, you can actually click the small uh, planet icon and go to the uh, LVM website for the specific um, like uh, check description. So which is helpful because names are actually not that always helpful <laughs> because I'm always struggling with getting what's going on under the hood of this check uh, when I'm just reading for the name. It's not always um, obvious. Um, and yeah, and finally, we added some uh, ability to provide extra settings for the Docker tool chain, like the one which were requested by our users, like port and volume bindings and some others. So uh, if you're using the Docker tool chain, you just have it uh, have more settings and it's kind of more flexible. And probably the only new feature which actually made it to the uh, EAP of C-Line is the CMake profiling. And this is actually quite nice. So starting for, uh, with CMake, 3.18, you can now kind of profile your scripts and trying to now to discover what actually takes time when the CMake is running on your project. So C-Line can now visualize that. So we're just using the CMake building feature and then just visualize the results. So you can see this uh, nice flame charts and click in some specific places, navigate. So just try and try to uh, if, you, if you have a long time uh, taken by your CMake scripts, you can now just try and uh, find out what's going on there, actually, and try and maybe fix that. Um, yeah, and that's mostly it about the C-Line. Uh, in terms of FreeSharp C++, that's, again, the quality improvements release. And we're also focusing on polishing our Unreal Engine support. Uh, so, and just uh, trying to make it um, more... Uh, flexible, but also adapting it to the actual version of Unreal Engine you're using so that we're not suggesting, you know, things which are not supported in your case. And uh, right now we're also working on fixing some issues with Catch <laughs> version 3. <free. laughs> um, hopefully that will also make it to the uh, final release. That's and I mentioned actually... Free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the some support, <laughs> uh, but we'll see how the changes are coming to catch. So uh, it seems that it's not quite stable right now. Um, anyway, so I mentioned Unreal Engine and I have to um, actually talk about the third tool here as well now, and that's Rider. So which is... Um, Usually we talk about Rider as a .NET IDE, but uh, right now we just uh, merged the Unreal Engine support uh, to main Rider, and we're going to release it in 2022.1. So Rider will cover like both Unity and Unreal Engine cases from that time. So it's already available in uh, EAP. No need to you know to go to some special form to register and to get some special license key from us. So just you know take uh, the free EAP builds and you can give it a try. And so we're polishing it and we plan to release it in March as well. So yeah, and I think that's all the news about our C++ tools. <laughs> that was uh, a lot of news for uh, an, no new features release. <laughs> yeah, but like when you kind of start digging into the yeah. um, various bug fixes reports and you want just to know to polish some specific workflows and to make them like work uh, the best way. So there are lots of things you can talk actually about. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a good sign, I think. Okay. Great. Okay, then I think we are ready to move on to and finally. <laughs> so this month, we have this Reddit post. What would you remove from C++ to make it a more concise language? 
and didn't have to uh, care about backwards compatibility or fix if ABI weren't an issue. So two uh, cons- non-constraints there, <laughs> but both of which have been holding C++ back. But if we didn't have those constraints, backwards compatibility with C and previous versions of C++, and if we didn't have to maintain ABI compatibility, what would we remove? And yeah, quite a, a hot thread there, I think. <laughs> so what were your thoughts on this? Yeah, actually, I think the the actual question was maybe one in response to maybe um, to many EBI related talks, you know, now at conferences when people are trying to explain mm-hmm. how uh, do we really care about the EBI stability, and they uses these various examples of the features which are not making their path to the language because they were rejected because of the EBI, whatever. So, and I think that's uh, kind of. Uh, Fred um, answering <laughs> and giving examples of that. And there were many, many things that were uh, very common to those who comment uh, on this post. And I think the top um, reply was probably that uh, the suggestion to uh, reject the integer conversion to bool or any yeah. kind of implicit conversions. I think that's yeah. the most popular one. So, and it seems that many people see the need for it, but prefer to have some maybe more manual control over it. I mean, like, yeah, you can keep it, but like, let me know what's going on there. (laughs) Don't do that silently. Um, And in case of even the literals where the need for implicit conversion is seen by many, uh, there is still a suggestion to improve the things. Uh, I think there was suggested like make literals have unique types implicitly convertible to suitable integer types, which also sounds reasonable. So yeah, uh, that was probably the, uh, this is probably the, the top <laughs> suggestion um, in the whole thread. So it was repeated many, many times with the long discussions of like how hard it is, how bad it is, so how to live with it. <laughs> so yeah, um, another popular, very popular idea I would say was about making variables uh, const by default, or at least having that for function parameters. So I think I also met that for um, dozens of time in the thread and everyone were kind of supportive for the idea, I guess, that didn't have um, any uh, questions or any concerns from the audience. Um, there was also like the uh, suggestion mentioned many times to reject fault through in default, uh, by default in switch case operator. So I think I also seen that for many times. And actually, there was a very nice answer, which I called <laughs> a list of denials. So like how to revert things you you have in C++ right now, like const should be an absence of mutable, explicit should be an absence of implicit and so on and so forth. So just, you know, turn the whole world upside down <laughs> and then everything is good enough. Not sure that's the proper thing to do, but the kind of the answer was really, really interesting um, I yeah, I met. <laughs> yeah, I also met an interesting idea just to cancel the uh, old C style cast at all. Uh, there are like a few times, uh, which was a surprise for me is that the idea to actually, uh, you know, uh, do something about the undefined behavior. Uh, that was the idea which I met only after maybe hundreds of commands <laughs> in this thread. I was expecting it to be earlier. Um, yeah, anyway, and Phil, what, what, what's the answer for you, by the way? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I find it difficult to pin it down to just one thing. But I think if I could pin it down to a group of things, it would be one of the things you alluded to, which is how all of the defaults are backwards. And mm-hmm. we flip things around, so cons is default and no accept is default and that sort of thing, then we'd be in a, a better place. But unfortunately, that... That's the sort of thing that we're unlikely to see addressed in the language because it's, <laughs> that's so much of a breaking change. For some it's of the just other a things, different language. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm surprised that Rust wasn't mentioned more often as a. Well, I guess this, this, it was. This is what Rust it, is. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it was mentioned once or twice, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but some of the things like the the switch fall through was probably a good example of one where okay, we're not going to change how switches work at this point. Uh, with regards to fall through, but we are working on a new feature that could actually do everything that switch does plus more, which is the the new pattern matching syntax. Mm-hmm. And you could say, well, once we've got that, never use a switch statement again. Just write pattern matches, and that will have you know work 
built in our, our current best practice of you know no fall through and, and various other things like that. So although we will still have switch in the language, if you're not writing new switch code, you shouldn't fall into the, those same traps. So in some ways, adding to the language does still make it simpler, even if technically it doesn't. I think that there's some hope in, in some some regards, at least. Yeah, yeah. And actually, in that, you know, list of uh, denials, as they called it, uh, the uh, there was one thing about the const expert as well, like const expert should be the absence of the runtime. <laughs> so this one I specifically liked. Um, so probably I'm voting for that <laughs> and for the yeah. implicit conversions. The, the other thing which uh, you, you did touch on, the uh, undefined behavior. Uh, uh, yeah, I was also surprised that that didn't come up until quite late, but it's almost um, it's almost like, why would you use C++ if you weren't <laughs> you know, not, not only prepared to deal with undefined behavior, but that wasn't actually part of the reason why you were using C++. I, I know there are reasons in general that mm -hmm. people are using it that are not to do with that, but the reason for the language's existence um, <laughs> in, in the modern world of languages is largely resolves around its ability to expose you to, and in some cases protect you from, undefined behavior. So if we didn't, if we completely got rid of it, we would lose one of the main advantages of, of C++ in the first place, I think. I mean, that's one of the things that's not so well understood when it comes to these sort of discussions. Yeah, it looks like a new language is going to be born <laughs> in this thread. <laughs> maybe that's Rust, but maybe something else. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I think yeah. every time we have a thread like this, which is not too infrequently, <laughs> there's, a, there's at least one new language born here. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Okay, well, that um, brings us to the end of, of yet another episode. And as I say, next month, hopefully, all going well. Expect to see some changes. Uh, one of which will be, hopefully, that we'll, we'll run a little bit earlier. We're going <laughs> to try, try and stick to the beginning of the month or maybe even right at the very end of, of this month. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, certainly it's got a little bit too too far into February for the uh, for the January edition this time. So we will see you very soon. Hope <laughs> going well. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> see you soon. Bye. <laughs>